Welcome to the Theology in Motion podcast. Join us for conversations about the theology of worship, its practice, culture, and design. The Theology in Motion podcast is by the Center for Worship Leadership, Christ College, Concordia University, Irvine, in California. Welcome to Theology in Motion. On behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership, we're glad that you are here. Today, we have a very special episode going behind the music of the recent Psalm Library release, Psalm 130, Out of the Depths, and we have with us three guests. Dr. C.J. Armstrong is here. C.J. is Professor of History and Theology at Concordia University, Irvine, and Assistant Pastor at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, Hacienda Heights, California. His PhD is from UCI, University of California, Irvine, and he loves teaching Greek, Latin, uh, readings of those languages, ancient history, mythology, social history, the Bible. He directs CUI's honors program, and he is the co-author of the song, Out of the Depths. Uh, CJ, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We also have on the line Kip Fox. Uh, Kip is the other uh, author of the song. He's been leading worship for many years, writing songs for many years. He's a nationally recognized songwriter, a worship leader. Uh, He's getting his master's in theology. Not only is he himself writing many of these psalm arrangements for the psalm library, but he's doing many things behind the scenes, and he's directing the Center for Worship Leadership Songwriter Initiative, encouraging songwriters in their craft. Kip, it is so great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us here again. It's my pleasure to be here. And then we have Ariel McMahon. He's a graduate from Concordia, Irvine, uh, a music major, director of worship at Victory Church in San Diego, and she's the featured artist on the release, Psalm 130. She sang the song very beautifully, and we're just honored to have her uh, with us to talk about her process in the song itself. Ariel, thanks for being here as well. Thank you. All right, so let's get into it. The song, let's go ahead and take a listen to the song first so we know what we're talking about. Then after we hear it together, we'll get into the content. See you will come from on high 
All right, that was Psalm 130, Out of the Depths, written by C.J. Armstrong and Kit Fox, featuring Ariel McMahon, and all three of them are here. Let's get into the text of Psalm 130. C.J., can you help us understand what was this song uh, based on, what's going on, the theology of Psalm 130? Where'd you start in the process? I, I, I love this song. Uh, it's, it's one of the songs of a sense that um, uh, section of the 150 psalms in the Psalter uh, that are called Songs of Ascents from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And uh, we have to imagine that uh, when uh, uh, families were on their way traveling as pilgrims to Jerusalem for the High Holy Feast days, these were the kinds of songs that they'd sing to one another. This is one uh, interpretation of ascents, why they're called songs of ascents, because mm-hmm. they would ascend that uh uh, slowly sloping hill up to Jerusalem. And, and these would be the, the songs that they'd sing as, as they go along. And uh, they range from uh, uh, beautiful, brief, devotional things like Psalm 131. Uh, my, my soul is comforted within me uh, like a weaned child with his mother. I, I do not set my, my eyes too high. You know, you have comforted me. Lord, uh, to uh, psalms that we may be a little more familiar with, um, uh, like Psalm uh, 121, uh, I, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does okay. my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And, and this one, Psalm 130, uh, with, within that corpus is what we would probably um, topically term a, a penitential psalm, a, a psalm uh, for the the woman, the man who feels as if they're uh, in the depths. And then that's why it starts off with that. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Yahweh. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Um, somebody who is beset uh, by enemies, somebody who is beset by sin. Um, it's, it's one of the several penitential psalms throughout uh, the Psalter. And so uh, that's where I, I think we, we come to it from the, the very first line of it. Out of the depths I cry to you, hmm. O Yahweh, O Lord. Um, and then it means that this is uh, a subjective kind of first person plea, like so many of the Psalms are. Uh, it's I, me, myself. I've got some problems here, Lord, and I'm crying to you. Don't ignore my voice. Um, and, and we, uh, then, then trace through a little bit more uh, to verse three. If iniquities are the things that you would mark, if, if you would uh, keep, if, if you'd preserve a, a list, a catalog of all the bad things I've ever done, well, who could stand then, Lord? Hmm. But with you, there's forgiveness. So we know this is a penitential psalm. This is not just, I'm in the depths because everybody hates me. <laughs> uh, this is not a I'm in the depths because I'm having a, a, a bad day. It's I'm, I'm in the depths because I'm a sinner. Mm. And I've got a, a laundry list of things, but you don't keep that laundry list for it. And so as we move from the beginning of the psalm to the end of the psalm, we also see the move to, it's not just about me. In verse eight, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. There is chesed, the, the, the agape love is how we do it in, in, in Greek, the, the sacrificial, uh, unending, undying love that the Lord has, not just for me, myself, and I. It's the love that he has for Israel, his chosen people, the, 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 the people through whom he wants to save the entire world. So it goes from first person singular to everybody. And that's a good thing because it turns out that everybody is a sinner. <laughs> and we all are beset with that laundry list of iniquities that the Lord himself does not mark. It's a beautiful psalm, and it's a, it's a simple one. It's only eight verses. And this is one that uh, we repeat in our uh, liturgy in the uh, Catholic tradition, in the Lutheran uh, tradition of, of liturgy. Uh, we uh, bring these verses out at, at times of confession and absolution, mm-hmm. but it's also one that I go through week by week as well as I uh, uh, sing the psalms, as I chant the psalms, and um, the songs of a sense in general are, are some of my favorites. Amazing. Yeah, so it, was, so it sounds like this, as you studied the text of this psalm, then 
what kind of of information did you send to to Kip as the songwriter? How did you help him see the things that you saw in that text? What were some of the theological things you pointed out, and how did you kind of maybe systemize the approach of it? Yeah, there were a couple of things that um, I, I come to at it that with because I'm a, a theologian. I'm also uh, somebody who's a real fan of poetry, whether mm-hmm. it's from the Bible or, or not. And so I'm always looking at words and, and thinking about uh, what what the poet is doing in, in his song. And uh, there's this word that uh, we have, the, the keep, the, this keep word. If you should keep iniquities, if you should guard iniquities, this is the, the verb in Hebrew, the shamar. And it, it shows up again in the, in, in the repetition of uh, uh, Psalm 130, uh, uh, verse 6. Um, so if you should keep iniquities... Uh, then who could stand but with you there is forgiveness. And then in, in verse six, it says, my soul waits for the Lord more than keepers, more than guards, more than oh. watchers wait for the morning. It, there's uh, an echo. There's a resonance mm-hmm. there. Uh, we, uh, as I brought that up, I thought that's really interesting poetically. And in fact, we really didn't do much with that. And that's fine. I, I don't think yeah. there is really much to do with that. Um, but then there are a couple of other words in the, in the same way that there's, I, I think, some words, some phrases, even a conjunction. It's, it's just really special here. There's some wordplay going on with uh, this idea of waiting. I wait for Yahweh, it says in verse 5. I wait for Yahweh. The, the mm-hmm. verb is kawa in, in Hebrew. My soul, my nephesh, it kawas. And I hope, the verb is yahal, but it still means wait. So I wait for Yahweh. My soul waits and I wait on his word. That's how God reveals himself. It's not just a pie in the sky kind of hope, a Peter Pan faith trust and pixie dust or something mm-hmm. like that. <laughs> I've got an object that I'm waiting on, the word of Yahweh. My soul waits for Yahweh, for the Lord, more than watchers wait for the morning. This, that's an expression of confidence. A, a, a trust that corresponds to the arrival of the dawn. I know that Yahweh will give me his word, just as he will bring the light as well. And I think in the song, you hear that come out in, in that last line so wonderfully in, in, in this a correspondence, not only with the sun rising, but with the sun rising, not just the S U N. Oh, and yeah. put your hope in the risen sun. It's, it's extraordinary yeah. stuff that comes out of the psalm itself in its very language and that an artist can can, um, play with. And and I'd like to point out one more, especially, uh, and and this has to do with the the grammar of verse four. It's only about five words in the Hebrew language. And in English, we translate this like, but with you, there is forgiveness with the purpose that, uh, or to the end that, you will be feared or that you may be feared. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty compressed mm-hmm. in the, in the Hebrew poetic line. But uh, one of the, one of the bits that I think is so fascinating theologically with this, uh, besides just the word fear, and we can talk about that uh, too, as, as we have time, but um, it, it is that conjunction with the purpose of that, or in order that, or, or to the end that, because notice what's what's happening with that. God's forgiveness is the cause of fear. Um, with you, there's forgiveness. And, and here's the result that happens because of that. Because God is a forgiving God, that creates a new identity or a new relationship mm-hmm. between the person that he forgives, the nation that he forgives, and the God who doesn't count iniquity, but instead has forgiveness, like a complete contrast to what could be the case. God doesn't have to forgive. I'm in the depths and nothing has to happen. But with you, there's forgiveness. And that causes a new relationship, a new Mm -hmm. identity that you may be feared. You know, in in Genesis, uh, we have a lot of titles for this Lord of heaven and earth. He's called God. He's called Adonai, Lord. He's called Yahweh, this personal name that he gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He's uh, uh, got 
um, the, the, the titles El Shaddai, you know, the, the Almighty. You can go through a lot of different titles. Uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, the, the Lord of armies, <laughs> yeah. God of hosts, right? Um, in, in, in Genesis, he's also called one time, he's called the fear of Isaac. Isn't that weird? He's called the fear of Isaac. That's, that, that's the word pachad, the fear of Isaac. It, it means fright and shaking and quaking. This is a God who will make you shake in your boots. And, and this word that's used for fear, yara, um, it can also mean fear, as in fright. This is about shaking and quaking, about earthquake and plague. This is about fire in the day of the Lord. But it's used so often in the Old Testament also about worship. Fear the Lord, mm. yeah, as in reverence, as in awe. It's, it's used about wisdom, right? Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that means faith. Would I associate that conjunction with the purpose that you are feared? Would I associate that conjunction of, of Psalm 130 verse 4 with most is from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 2, uh, where he says that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's God's goodness that leads us to repentance and faith. That's about a relationship with the Lord of heaven and earth. And it's his goodness that it be, as, as my brother, Dr. Middendorf says, it be all God, all Christ, all the time, all grace, all the <laughs> yeah. time, right? That's it's one of the uh, things that I hear him say to his students all the time, all God, all grace, all the time. That's what leads us to a relationship of, of repentance and faith. Hmm. So you're and suggesting, oh, go ahead. The reason that I bring this up I, I, is also because this is, is one of the great turning points in the song, Out of the Depths. Um, uh, the turning of our hearts begins with your forgiving hand. I, that's just an extraordinary line. Hmm. I think theologically for me, that, that's where I went. All, all the eggs in my basket for that song theologically are right there. <laughs> That's profound. And it's so interesting because I think uh, most people, in terms of the way they think about these words, would say once they have received the forgiveness, that that removes the fear. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that it redefines maybe the oh, relationship. And yeah. God is still this above one. Yeah, but the the fear is different. Is that right? Is that what we're saying? It's a different yeah, quality. It's, it's, it's not just fear to the point that uh, I know he can squash me like a bug. Yeah, the, the kind of fear that all the angels always say, right? Do not be afraid. What's the first thing an angel says when he appears in the Bible? <laughs> right. He says, "Do not be afraid." The, the, there's shepherds around washing their socks by night, and, and, and then all of a sudden, boom! The angel choir is there, and what do the angels say? They say, "Don't be afraid." Why? Because there's a puddle underneath every shepherd. At yeah. that point. God is scary, right? God is, a, that, that's fear. But there's also this wisdom, this awesomeness. Mm -hmm. In fact, in, in the uh, first drafts of, of what Kip and I were working with together, uh, those lines um, ended up changing because it's, it's not easy to get a sense of what the, what, what's a good English equivalent yeah. for that. American English, we love to use the word awesome. Everything is awesome. I use the word awesome all the time. And uh, that, that's got a lot of valences, a lot of different meanings that, that, that could be there. But it's not just about uh, uh, ineffable power and awe and majesty and, and uh, the, the glory of heaven. There's also, as, as you just said, I think helpfully, Steve, a changed relationship. You know, I, there, there are times when I was afraid of my dad growing up. And I still respect him and revere him. And I think he's awesome. Hmm. Um, but it's it's not because <laughs> I'm quaking in my boots thinking, oh, what are you going to say to me this time? <laughs> because right. of what I've done. <laughs> right. Thank you, CJ. There's a lot there. And it's a lot of good stuff. So once that kind of, Kip, as you're reading the psalm yourself and receiving this input theologically and textually, how did you start with the poetics? How did, like, where did you begin in the writing process? Um, well, this, this Psalm in particular, um, I feel like was a bit, uh, easier than, than, than many to kind of attack just because of its number one, its length, uh, it being shorter in length <laughs> and having sort of less to tackle. Um, but also because of just the, 
the sort of guttural, guttural reaction we have immediately to reading those words out of the depths I cry. Um, and to me, that just kind of jumps off the page to me. Hmm. So that's where it started. And um, so, it I, starts uh, the same, so the song and the psalm start the same way. They both right. start out of the depths I cry. Yes. Hmm. And, you know, that's not always the case. Most of the time it's not. Most of the time you're trying to figure out how to do it. But it's, it's, it's just a, it's a phrase and it's a feeling that translates, I feel like, hmm. to everyone in any time and place. So there wasn't any uh, massaging of the vocabulary or sort of um, summarizing of, of the feeling. Uh, it's right there at the start. And it's, it's, it's really, I always think of things in terms of their singability. And uh, as a phrase, out of the depths I cry, to me, um, it, it sort of sings as you read it. So uh, that's really where it started. And, you know, as Dr. Armstrong said, um, it's really the, the, the theme of the, of the psalm. It's the, it's the feeling of the psalm. It's the, 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 uh, the cry of the psalm. So uh, that's really where it started. And again, I guess to walk you through, I say that Psalm 130 was a bit easier just because if you read it, you, you see these sort of four distinct sections. And in try, trying to write in our um, sort of modern um, modern song mindset, uh, a lot of times you've got these psalms that are 18 to 30 verses long, and they're most of the time they're additive in style. Uh, they don't they don't sort of circle back and uh, tightly uh, wrap everything up for you. Uh, they're they're often adding on one another, and the same thing sort of happens here. Um, but there are very clear cut um, sections, and there are only four of them. And so, in in a in a modern setting, uh, to be able to fit those into a verse, a chorus, a bridge, mm-hmm. and essentially a second bridge, yeah, is is helpful, um, and it takes away some of the work of trying to take a massive piece and fit it into uh you know get all the themes in so to speak um it was easier that way so uh i would say that it it sort of all happened linearly in terms of uh that first that first section out of the depths i cry and getting a melody going for that and when I, i i do know that when i first started this and i remember sort of checking in with cj on this uh that stylistically i knew it was going to sound a bit um, uh, I guess different is, is the easiest word to say that, that it would, um, as you can hear the recording that it, there's kind of, a uh, this sort of aggressive hop to the song. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, I wanted to make sure that we could still capture, um, the feeling and the emotion and, uh, represent what the psalm was without it being distracting. <clears throat> so what I had come up with, um, and the way that the song is translated now in terms of the recording, um, there's a strong beat to it. But I also f- thought and ran by CJ the possibility of keeping the same melody and the same uh, structure, but sort of making it more like a ballad in a sense, uh, get, getting it to be softer, getting it to be um, uh, I guess a bit more formal, mm. uh, and thankfully Dr. Armstrong was was encouraging to just keep going with the direction it was headed, um, and that that was huge for me because, um, you know, a lot of times when you're 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 really you're trying to capture the emotion here, right? And you're trying to to you're using how you feel about your relationship with God, and you're translating. Uh, this, these words uh, to to fit your reality, and it was just easier for me to continue on with just the way I felt about yeah. how this how this would come out of me, you know, how this felt coming out of my heart. So that was big. Um, and then from there, you know, what I consider to be the chorus: "If you, Lord, uh, kept a list of all our sin." Um, 
just kind of went with there. I, I saw the repetition uh, and I started to, to think that this could be a, a good use of repetition to that would make the song, again, more singable, more uh, easily understandable. And then uh, when I got to the, the, to me, the verses five and six are, I guess, just always stick out to me in terms of the imagery they portray. And um, mm-hmm. that's the, I wait for the know, Lord. My soul yeah, just waits. The watchman. Yeah, especially, you know, more than a watchman wait for the morning. I think yeah. we've all, we've all read that and gone, you know, we, we understand that imagery from maybe, you know, I mean, most of us haven't experienced that <laughs> personally, but we've seen movies, we've seen, we understand what the role of a watchman is and how, um, <laughs> how deep that longing must be to see the sunrise. Mm. Um, and so that was a case where, um, you know, the song picks up in intensity and, um, because you feel that intensity, um, you associate watchmen waiting for, uh, the morning in, in a, in a situation where there is fear all around them. There's a situation where they're anticipating, um, the worst. And so, um, really this, the, in answer to your original question, this all kind of happened pretty linearly, yeah. um, for me. And, and thankfully it was the size and scope of the Psalm itself made that easier. The the first time I heard this song, and so it builds, right? The song is in a way, it has this chorus that it kind of rotates around, but at the same time, it's not really a verse chorus verse chorus song. It's it's mm-hmm. building somewhere. And the first time I heard this song, that bridge that you mentioned, my body, my spirit, my heart and my soul are watching. That uh really made me it really that line really hit me in a strong in a, in a very strong way because I don't think I I it interprets that verse a little bit differently in a way because the verse itself would say I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And the way that you interpreted it gave me the sense, it kind of made me think about all those aspects of myself and how they were all together waiting. And I thought that Mm -hmm. was really profound. Can you talk a little about that process, about choosing to talk about body, spirit, heart, soul? How did that happen in that that work? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it, it kind of, to me, in, again, in just reading those five and six there, it just jumps off the page to me that it's, it's more, it, it's, <laughs> um, even that, that repetition when he, he says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits mm-hmm. in his word, I hope my soul waits for the, and, it, and he repeats more than what, the fact that he's repeating more than watchmen wait for the morning to me, um, it just it just said to me, okay, everything in me is waiting for this, um, and so it just it just kind of spilled out, you know. It just yeah. felt like, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, that that's basically how it happened. It was just okay. If I were, you know, I am I'm a lover, not a fighter. I, I don't I don't think I would last two seconds in any sort of uh, battle. Uh, involving um, swords or anything like that. <laughs> and so um, uh, to me, if I were a watchman, uh, everything in me would be waiting for the morning. <laughs> everything, yeah. Every fiber of my being would be waiting to, for that relief. And, uh, <laughs> and so again, translating that to hope in the Lord, translating that into deliverance, um, from my God into translating that into, um, just hearing, uh, or seeing God's, God's providence. Um, I, I kind of just combined those two things. So, uh, that's really how it happened. Just, just said, mm-hmm. okay, this is when he says soul, I, I, I hear everything, everything in me. And that's, I think what you should hear as you read the word nefesh in Mm -hmm. the old Testament, right? When this gets into my history classes, my ancient philosophy classes, you know, the questions about what's a soul. Well, we've got this, 
this bifurcation of body and soul. And, and uh, we, we generally think about this stuff because we're all students of Plato and uh, the Western uh, philosophical tradition and whatnot. But, um, you know, I, I don't think this, the psalmist, I, I don't think David or whoever wrote this psalm um, was consulting Plato. When he was <laughs> trying to get at what a what his soul was. there's no soul without a body there's no body without a soul they always go together like peanut butter and chocolate right mm-hmm. two great tastes mm-hmm. taste great together and so you've got I, I think uh, uh, something very key there that's that's what the poetry of the psalm is trying to get at mm-hmm. the entire person every ounce of my being is waiting on the Lord yeah and Kip I yeah, and- I think that plural that's what as a listener that spoke really deeply to me cuz I was surprised when I first heard the plural when it said my body spirit heart and soul are watching the- well that's it's funny you say that because um that's kind of this is where Ariel enters into the picture um in well she does in many ways but uh originally that line I I was always going back and forth between is and are mm-hmm. is and are is and are and I felt like this something about saying is, is, is felt good to me. And so I handed it off to Ariel and without mentioning anything. Yeah. And, um, she sang the whole, the whole tune recorded it, you know, just did an awesome job with that. Got it back to me. It sounded absolutely brilliant. Amazing. And then I heard, I heard her switch it to R. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we actually had a conversation about that. Um, and, it was really, honestly, it's one of those sort of in the, in the moment, sort of as you're doing production thoughts and going through what you want to do, making that decision. Um, and so Errol, I don't know if you can, you can tell me, you can maybe speak to that conversation we had. Yeah. I, I remember talking about that and you know, we were going back and forth is or are, but I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't even think about it when I was singing it. I was mm-hmm. so into it because I was just like, I'm waiting like yeah. in this moment, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting my soul, my body, my spirit. Well, like I'm waiting. So it's our really, I don't know. I just saying our, and that's how yeah. it happened. Yeah. And so as we, she, we talked about it by the phone and, and, and it started to make, again, it was this decision where in my mind, sometimes as a writer, you just get so stuck in what's sort of syllabically sounds, um, sounds right to you yeah and so even though it felt like r and this may be too tedious but even though i felt like r didn't quite sound right or sound as as good off of the tongue um r was what was always the right choice and r made sense with how the lyric went and so it was it was pretty cool that that happened because very easily ariel could have sung it down straight and we wouldn't really be having this conversation. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or just Ariel's brilliance or uh, a happy accident, but um, it's just interesting that you mentioned that. I, and I thought it was something interesting to share about how the song yeah. uh, got finished from r- writing it to uh, to it hitting the... I want to cover one last thing about the the text of the what Kip wrote here, and then I want to get into the performance parts of it. And... Um, Dr. Armstrong was mentioning this move from the individual to the community. And I see that you also captured that. As you approach that in your writing, what kind of thoughts were you thinking about in terms of poetics or how to approach the move from the individual into, into bridge two, <clears throat> where we really speak to the church? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's pretty clear there what's happening and uh, in terms of this plea for Israel. And I've, I've kind of all, I've understood uh, that we can uh, we can safely and fairly uh, attach um, the church today uh, and and see it as a new Israel. And so, to me, in order to put that song in a context that would make sense, in order to make it relevant, so to speak, and really, I guess, in a way, to translate it in our uh, modern text, it felt like the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that's something that maybe CJ can speak to as well. It's something that we talked about mm-hmm. uh, and that he affirmed for me, CJ, in terms of just Israel and the church today. And how we read that in the Old Testament? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I think I, I said that directly to you. Um, as as uh, I think I put it in language like you, your transformation of of Israel of the of the Psalm in verse eight to the Church in Christ, New Israel. 
in, in the closing bit of the song is absolutely how we read the Psalms. And, and this gets to a, a, a truism that I uh, begin my own teaching and, and thinking about the Psalms uh, uh, in, in general. And that is that there's, this is the prayer book of Jesus Christ himself, who is all Israel reduced to one man. Out of Israel, I called my son. You know, this is this is Israel reduced to one, which is why he's uh, uh, baptized in the Jordan River for all humanity, which is why he's uh, tempted in the desert and yet without sin for all humanity. All these things he did for us because he is Israel reduced into one. And if, if the Psalms are the prayer book of Jesus Christ himself, then nobody's allowed to pray these Psalms except for him and those to whom he gives them to all who are in Christ. And so as Christians approach this uh, devotional collection of the Old Testament, uh, we, we do so because they are Christ's prayers for us. And so we only understand them, interpret them, pray them. We only do so in Christ. Uh, which is why also it, our regular liturgical use of psalms always ends with that doxology, uh, glory be to the Father and to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. You know, if you're in, in a church that uh, has those kinds of liturgical scruples, you're always going to hear the psalms um, uh, recited or uh, uh, echoed back and forth antiphonally uh, or, or read in an introit or some, some other kind of uh, a section of, of, of divine service. But you're always going to end it in a Christian church with that doxology, because we read them in Christ. And so who is Israel? Uh, Israel, then, is all of those who are in Christ. This is what to be chosen is. This is what his election is all about. This is what uh, our standing is before the Lord in Christ. And so uh, I, I think that's an absolutely appropriate transformation. Oh, church of God, lift up your eyes. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, wait for the risen one. You know, Christ is in there from beginning to end, but he's uh, expressed uh, deliberately and, con uh, and precisely uh, in, in that last line. Awesome. So Ariel, as the voice of the song, what was it like to sing someone else's words? You know, because this you're, you're in a way making this song your own, but that's in the tradition of making the Psalms your own. So I guess that's even a little more natural. But what was it like taking that the song and making it your own as you performed it? Honestly, it was it was it wasn't that hard because as Professor Armstrong and Kip said that this psalm, I feel anyone can relate to it because we've all been to the lowest of low in our lives. And we can all look at the psalms and say, Yeah, I've been there and I've cried out and I've needed this. And so for me it was I connected so well to it because, you know, we've, we've all been there. And what really tied it together for me was when it said, um, Oh, church arise mm. because it gave me chills because everything that we're living through right now and everything that the church is going through. And it gave me this fuel, this push that like, no, as a church, we need to wake up. We need to show everyone that we have this hope. And this hope will not put us to shame, as in Romans 5 says. And because we have this, we need to be a light. And I lo I really loved it. I really loved uh, the words that you guys wrote. It was amazing. It's beautiful. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. I love the fact that when I was hearing you guys talk out about it right now, mm. it's crazy because everything that you guys were saying, that connected to my core. And because it says when watchmen are waiting, like the waiting really, really, really got to me because, you know, as a believer, we're not able to wait if we don't see an end result. We, we're not, if we don't have faith, like our faith allows us to wait. And if we don't have faith, then what are we waiting for, you know? And it's like watchmen aren't going to leave their post in the middle of the night because they know they know hope is coming. They know the sun is going to rise. It has to rise, but it's in those moments of waiting when you're just God, I need you. And so really singing that, like, I'm waiting. I know you're going to come. I know, like, you have to come because you say that you are, you know. And the only thing, as Professor Armstrong said, the only thing we have to hang on to is his word. Like in Luke 19, it says they hung on every word that he mm. said. And it's like, 
we've never touched God. We've never held his hand. We've never seen his form. Only thing we have is his word to hang on to. And so I really love the fact that, you know, we're waiting and it's not easy to wait, but because hope, we have hope, you know, it allows us to wait and, and it allows us to have hope in the waiting. And so I really just loved Mm -hmm. that song. And I, it was crazy because when first Kip first sent it to me, it was just him and an acoustic guitar. And then we talked about it and then it was just, um, like this big thing. And I was like, yeah, like let's go. Because I felt like every single, I just loved everyone who played on it. I don't, I haven't met them, but I love them because they, (laughs) it sounds like everyone played with their whole heart and they gave their best. And I just really loved it. And yeah, thank you for letting me be a part of it. Thank you. And thank you for being a part of it. Uh, There's a lot, there's a way in which, um, your presentation of this song is what people hear. And in a, in a profound way, you know, you brought the gifts that God has given you to, to bear with the, to, to proclaim the text of the song, to welcome people into that last promise. And um, so thank you for, for being a part of it. And um, as, you, as you approach the song and you prepare to record it and you recorded it, was there anything in terms of like a vocal technique or as you sang through the song, you know, certain sections that stood out to you? What was that process like of actually recording the vocal part? Honestly, I had a lot of fun. I mean, I was really scared to do it. I'm like, a, I don't know. I'm always nervous. I feel, I told Kip, I was just like, I'm going to do it. And like, mm-hmm. this is what God has given me. And all I have to give is what you've given me, you know? And <laughs> yeah. so here it is. And it was weird to translate like the, just the acoustic to a big thing. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, like when I heard the church arise and this whole band, I'm like, yeah, we're waking up the church together with this song, you know, <laughs> like, so it was just like vocally starting it. Like I knew like, okay, I want to, out of the depths I cry, but we're going to cry softly in the beginning, you know, mm-hmm. and then we're going to intensify the cry as we go. And, and the end all the musicians are just crying with all their instruments, you know, and it got big and you're just like, you just go, you know? Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. I hear you, you really connected with the Psalm mm-hmm. as it was translated by CJ and Kip. And mm-hmm. then you offered in a way your translation of their work. Yeah. And uh, that's really a beautiful thing. Was it weird when you heard your song being translated and then like listening to it? Did you think it was going to come out like that at the end? <laughs> That's a great question. I would say that it was f- from the band standpoint, the recorded, you know, your vocalist side. Um, I'll get to that. It was what I was hoping for. It was kind of what I was hearing. The guys that worked on this to produce it and the, the, to play on it, you know, carried that out in a way that I could never do. And so that was really exciting to me. I thought it was, I thought it really captured my hopes for it. Yeah. And then you singing on it far exceeded my expectations in terms of, I mean, I knew that it would sound great because of the gift that you have in your voice. I didn't realize how kind of like Steve was saying, just your sort of translation of it vocally and the way that you put your heart into it would give it even more life. So in that way, I mean, I was really, really excited by that and really glad that we asked you to sing. And I hope that it's, uh, you know, that translates for other folks as well in terms of the way we represented this psalm. Yeah. I was real happy with it. Um, But to your question, Ariel, uh, when I heard the first work tape that uh, Kip had offered me, uh, one of the things that I had described to him um, as, as he was thinking about style and, and trajectory, uh, was I, I just gave him um, uh, my, uh, my, my gut. I, here's what I hear. I listen to a lot of music. I listen to a lot of uh, contemporary uh, liturgics and a lot of uh, 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 traditional liturgics as well. And uh, music as, a, uh, as an instrument, as a tool mm-hmm. in, in worship, uh, it, one one of those things is to set mood, to set emotion, and to to grab and to transform um, all as the vehicle to to deliver God's word. But it, it has a lot of other things that it can do with it too. And one of the words I used was poppy. 
P-O-P-P-Y. I said, okay, now this starts poppy and then we get less poppy and then we're not poppy at all. And then I said, it, it turns from green to blue. And I think that's the trajectory of this song too. Oh. But some of that, just from my own amateur musician point of view is it, I can I can hear notes. I know what chords are. I know how to, to, to work through stuff. And uh, the first work tape was... Uh, out of the, the side crowd, you know, I was, I was hearing pop, pop, pop with these major, major chords and whatnot. And that's not what the final product was. He had this, this wailing single note on the electric guitar coming over it uh, on, on every verse. And I was like, oh, dang, maybe that Pink Floyd comment I made to you back in March uh, kind of uh, infected <laughs> you with some, somehow. I think it was like little David Gilmore down here. And in, in any case, I, I thought that the transformation the, the evolution of it. And, and frankly, as Steve said, and, and Kip repeated, Ariel, your translation of it for the, the vocal, it, it exceeded expectations. Um, I, I've got a very critical ear and boy, my wife has an even more critical ear. She said, oh, <laughs> dang, that sings, man. That sings. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just have a question. Is it hard to like, give someone like your song is kind of like your baby in a sense or like give your song to someone else to sing it and like how uh, professor armstrong gave it to kip and was like i trust you in the direction that you're taking it like was that hard to like be like yeah i trust you take it where you you want it to go i i have no trouble with trusting kip at all <laughs> as a theologian and as uh as an artist and the yeah. skills and the and, the, and frankly, the gifts that yeah. that uh, he has, um, ab absolute trust. And I, I think it goes both ways because he was looking for criticism as, as well. Yeah. So just bring it on. And that had to do with the theological content and uh, thinking about orthodoxy, right, right teaching. Um, but but also um, not the criticism in a, in a negative way, but, but making things better that the construction of and, and reactions and reflections on uh, things like mood and, and style and whatnot. These are, these are bits that of course he's a master of. I feel like a, a contributor to this, yeah. um, but bringing it to birth yeah. requires a, a whole team. And I'm, I'm just ratified to have been even a, a, a contributor on this. The poetry of it and the performance of it is is what continues on, and so uh, uh, the, no no trouble at all contributing what I've contributed, and and then seeing how beautiful that poetry can be. Yeah, yeah, I I, I appreciate that, Doctor Armstrong. It was it was great, um, great, great to partner with you. Um, knowing that you're a musician yourself, knowing that. Um, your, your love for music of all of all shapes and sizes. And, you know, to me, obviously, sort of the, the scholarly work you brought to this is always invaluable, but there was such a devotional piece of this for you that, that you uh, communicated to me. I, that's such an important part to me in, in writing as well, to be able to connect to the content that you're, you're working on and to place that in your heart, really. The, the level of comfort there that you gave to me was, was amazing. And Ariel, for you, you know, handing it off to you, you know, there's a reason I chose for you to do, to sing it, uh, and so because of that, I wasn't worried at all. Uh, I I know it would it would be great. So, and I on to be honest, I'm glad I I'm really glad you sang it and that we did give it to you to sing because I, I re, I've told several people this that I there's no way this song would have been the same without you. So, mm -hmm. Amen. Wow, thank you. I loved being a part of it. I really felt it. Like, you know, in my spirit, I just, it really connected. I, I really loved it. It was beautiful words. And you guys speak so beautifully, too. So it was awesome. Well, we give thanks for each of the, the ways that God has gifted you guys. Uh, and give you thanks to God for the ways that you contributed to this Psalm 130, Out of the Depths. We pray that it'd be a blessing to the church and, and help to, in a way, appoint people to Christ in their time of feeling that they're in the depths, that they know that there is a waiting and there is a hope and there is a mourning in the resurrected Christ. And so uh, thank you for what you've done with this, this song and for offering it to the church through the Center for Worship Leadership Psalm Library. And thank you so much for your time today uh, sharing with us the process. Really appreciate each of you. Thanks a lot, Steve. 
Thank you. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Theology in Motion with Dr. C.J. Armstrong, Kit Fox, and Ariel McMahon talking about the making of Psalm 130, Out of the Depths, the Psalm Library, the Center for Worship Leadership. If you're interested in hearing more about the Psalm Library, check out our website, cwlonline.org. Join us next month for a host of new content at the Center for Worship Leadership. Here on Theology in Motion, we'll be interviewing Dr. Matthew Kamick on his book, co-written with Corey Wilson, called Work and Worship, as well as new panel discussions from On the Ground Floor, hosted by Matt Preston, and a new episode of How the Soup is Made, hosted by Corey Witt. If you haven't heard those podcasts, they're excellent. I'd like to encourage you to find them and listen to them. They're really enjoyable content. And thank you again for joining us today. Hope you have a great month. And if you're listening to this as it's coming out here in April 2021, he is risen. <laughs>